Hello, dear ones. Hello, family. You're at home. You're at home with Jim and Joy, and we want to hear from you. 1-800-221-9460, 205-271-2980. Email us at jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Obviously, Joy is not here with us for this show, as I shared last show. She's in New Jersey, grieving with her family the loss of a 20-month-old precious infant, our great Grand nephew Nicholas. So continue to pray. She's on her way back. She'll be here soon. But we have a very special guest with us for the first segment in Johnette Bankovic. Johnette, it's wonderful to have you here, Women of Grace. You are beloved by so many. Oh, Jim, thank you so much for your kind invitation. It's a delight to be with you here on your set and, and with all of our viewers and today. We want to know what Johnette Bankovic, Our Lady, and the United Nations have in common. That's what you're here <laughs> to speak about, so please tell us about that. Well, may, may we have the grace of God in common, yes. right? Uh, yes, I had an amazing opportunity recently. I was invited by the uh, Holy See Mission, permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations, as well as the permanent observer of Portugal to uh, the United Nations, to participate in a commemorative uh, event uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima. And it was, it was a... So this is like May 12th, right? It was Before? May 12th. It was just, yes, it's not all that long ago. Yeah. It was just last week. And I'm sort of in the afterglow of all of that, Jim, you know, because you, you participate in these momentous occasions and then you come back and you need time to reflect and process exactly right. what happened. But I was invited to participate in this remarkable event and I was asked to speak on Mary, uh, the uh, role of woman, uh, the dignity of woman and her role in promoting a culture of, of uh, dialogue, mediation, peacemaking, and peace building in 17 minutes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was a very big, uh, you know, very big topic uh, to tackle. But you know, the Holy Spirit, I think, uh, prepares us for those events. And of course, time of prayer is always what makes it happen. And I spent uh, a lot of time in prayer prior to, as I prepared my remarks Jenna, to be made. Was that, was that topic given to you? Or yes. You, okay. It was assigned to me by the Holy See mission. So the, the interesting uh, opportunity that this is, of course, is that the UN is a secular organization and it doesn't hold to any one particular religious right. expression. Uh, but the ambassador of Portugal uh, certainly saw this as a momentous moment for his country. And we, uh, through the Holy See Mission, the Catholic Church, it knew it to be a momentous occasion. Right. So I was invited, I was uh, uh, one of a panel of five individuals talking about a variety of things that were all related to peace building, which is the mission right. of the UN. Okay. And so we developed it according to the teachings of the church and according to the mission of the United Nations. Powerful. So peace is always such a huge theme for the United Nations. Yes, it is. Um, and women. And so yes. Mary as woman of peace. Yes, that's exactly, right. mm -hmm. that's exactly right. That's exactly right. What were some of your key points about that? Because I, I imagine you have to walk kind of gingerly or tenderly a little bit. You're or a smart man. You? <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact, you you know one of the things that you want to do is 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 to put it into a language that is accessible to everybody that's going to be listening. And this was uh, webcast to the world, and we had many different nations that were represented there. Uh, their ambassadors were there as well. Uh, the room was packed. There were guests there, so there were about six hundred people that were gathered in this one conference room of the How United many? Nations. Six hundred. Wow. And it was uh, uh, it was an interesting moment. And of course, y y I would guess to say that what my talk was, uh, not only was it unique in, in its topic uh, and, and certainly in the opportunity to talk about Our Blessed Lady, but it was unique in that there was also, uh, it, I was talking about intangibles. You know, I couldn't quote statistics or, or facts, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, how, you know, peacemaking and peace building is, is applicable to religious leaders or how it's applicable to children. Mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to begin to establish what is the dignity of woman? Right. Where does it come from? Right. Uh, what is her feminine genius? What do these things things mean. And so I approached it by a definition of authority yeah. uh, that is not the common definition and power, which is not the common definition, emanating from the assets and the gifts and the talents and, and the remarkable gender that's entrusted to the human person. Wow. So I developed that uh, through a little bit of philosophy. Uh, through going into some ancient texts, uh, which is the way I phrase that with regard to the Bible and the Quran. And we went into, wow. uh, you know, this, this remarkable moment 
of, of Adam's uh, uh, beholding Eve and what does bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh mean. Yeah. And then we went into the way in which that develops in the world and the call of women in every situation, every enterprise of life to bring this, this remarkable gift of being able to reflect to man who he is and the way in which he should go. Yeah. Basically yeah. being his North Star. Yeah. And ultimately we ended with our Blessed Lady, the quintessential woman yeah. who has a position in all women's lives, regardless of who they are, and in every man's life, too. Did you get a sense from the audience, were they getting it, or how did it impact them? Can you tell? I, yeah, well, from the comments afterwards, yeah. it was it was well received and understood. Good. You know, who I heard, understood, acknowledged. Yes. Well, Jonathan, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with us. Well, thank thank you, you for representing us and for being so blessed by Our Lady to do so, to bring her to the UN, to the world, like Our Lady of Fatima going yes. to the world. It was a remarkable opportunity. I praise and thank God for it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Kate Wicker is our guest, wife, mom of five, speaker. She's the author of Getting Past Perfect. This is a wonderful teaching and book for all moms, for all women, um, really knowing your true identity, your highest calling, as a child of God, a daughter of God, and finding joy and grace in the midst of the messiness of motherhood. Don't go away. We will be right back. Plenty more to come. Welcome back. You're an important part of the family. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. We have Kate Wicker with us here today. We want to hear from you. She's going to be sharing about getting beyond perfection and really understanding your own femininity, true womanhood. Give us a call, 800-221-9460 or 205-271-2980 or please email us, Jim and Joy, at EWTN.com, and hopefully we'll use your email. Kate, it is wonderful to be with you. Hi, um, I enjoyed reading the book. Thank you Getting so much. Getting Past Perfect. Um, and as I shared with you, you know, I, I read through, you sent me some notes on this, <laughs> which was almost like a book. <laughs> and I sent it on to some of the most important you know, women in my life. And I just said, <laughs> this is really wonderful. You really need to, to hear this. Tell us about yourself first. Sure. Uh, well, I'm Kate Wicker, and I have five children and a wonderful husband. And I, I keep saying that I have a great village because I've got a mother-in-law kind of holding down the fort with my husband yeah. with the four older ones, and my baby and my parents are here helping me. Um, yeah. And I'm uh, a writer and a speaker. This is my second book. I feel very passionate about encouraging women and mothers. I This is kind of a ministry that I was a secular journalist mm -hmm. and um, did some medical writing and health writing and I kind of fell into this and yeah. started writing what I was trying to live I don't say writing what I'm living because yeah. I'm still trying to live <laughs> some of it um, but it's been such a blessing um, to share my heart sometimes it's hard but to share it and to encourage other yeah. moms and women out there well you're young but you're down the road a ways with five children and uh, so there's a lot lot to share a lot to share but this whole area of getting past perfect this maybe a a category for perfectionism. There may be a psychological, mental category, and maybe it's just tendencies towards perfectionism. And we know they can really come out in marriage, mm -hmm. in family, in motherhood. Um, so what do you mean when you're speaking about getting beyond perfect? What do you mean by perfectionism? How broad do you think this really is, especially among mothers? Well, I think it's a really critical issue right now, and I, I usually tell people that there's three main reasons that I see that perfectionism, that women are really struggling, and I'll get on, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by perfectionism in just a minute, but okay. number one is social media. Um, we live in a very digital world, and a lot of times motherhood can feel a little isolating, especially I used to, when I had my little ones at home, I homeschooled, and I was alone a lot, so I started reaching out to people, their blogs were starting to become big and other Catholic moms I admired and now there's Instagram and Pinterest and you can get all these ideas. And it's 
it's a good thing, but it can also be a crippling thing because all of a sudden you think that you're doing an okay job and yeah. then you look on Pinterest and you yeah. think, well, gosh, yeah. my cake collapsed and looked awful and look at these, you know, concoctions that are yeah. perfect. And so you just it's kind of like women looking at supermodels. Yes, yes. And saying like, that's what I'm supposed to be like. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, I, I try and tell moms that that's a highlight reel. That's not their life. <laughs> like we're getting all the oh, dirty yeah. things out of the way and getting this perfect, you yeah. know, snippet of our life. And that, we used to just compare our grass and say it was greener, that maybe our neighbor's grass was greener. And now we have all these neighbors. It's just not the mom at church we admire, but it's all these people that we can right. see. And so that can definitely put pressure on us when really the only grass that's greener is God's. And that's what we really have to focus on. And then second of all, women, especially American women, we have a lot of choices now. Um, we can work outside of the home. We can stay in the home and focus on our, uh, our children. We can uh, write books. We can do all these wonderful mm. things. And all of a sudden this tyranny of choice, we think, we're not doing enough if we're just a mom or if we're working we feel like we're not giving enough to our children if even though if that work is what God is calling us to do so I think that there's again that tyranny of choice can put a lot of pressure and drive us to be perfect and then my, my last point is just women in general we are people pleasers and we uh, we have this design to, to nurture people, and that's a good thing, but sometimes we're nurturing to the point of exhaustion and burnout, and we, we have annihilated self-care in any form, and we can't do that either because you can't serve others if you're not taking care of yourself, yeah. including your relationship with God. You have to cultivate your prayer life. So I think those are three sort of things that can really contribute to this perfectionist drive, yeah. and when we say perfectionism, it doesn't mean we're not supposed to strive for excellence and try and be the best that God, but God created us to be us and not to be someone else. And we have to take our own gifts and talents and weaknesses and make the best of them yeah. and not make ourselves into someone else or be other focused, I often say, because I think perfectionism is often, well, what is everybody going to think of me? Like, yeah. should I make throw this elaborate birthday party, even though my one-year-old could care less. They just want the cake and get it on their face and get yeah. messy. You know, who are we doing this for? Are we do doing it for the glory of God and for the love of our children? Yeah. Or are we doing it to look like this super uber Catholic mom? Look at all the things I can do. Yeah. Um, and I know I have struggled with that, that, that vanity of, I want people to see that I have it all yeah. together. So there are outward, outer kind of influences and powers, whether it's social media, um, and you, you mentioned uh, choices mm -hmm. you know, that are out there, um, but I think you said something that was kind of like comparison. Oh yeah, comparison. Right, so so that's too. a pressure, right? Yes. I mean, uh, but then there's internal things as well. You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And even that the choices, uh, not the choices thing, but the comparison thing, a lot of that comes from internal as well. There's that phrase that says um, to compare is the end of peace. Oh, definitely. To compare. I, I talk about that. And when you compare, no one wins. Either you are comparing and you think, well, gosh, I thought I was a bad mom. At least I'm not, you know, doing what that mom over there is doing. <laughs> or you think, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get it together? Why can't I be more like so-and-so? And you can become either a lawyer or a judge or just collapse into a heap of self-doubt. And any of those things are not good. You've got to focus. I, I l often laugh. Miss Perry, if my sixth grade teacher is watching, because she said two things that yeah. have just sort of stuck with me and applied as a mother. Yeah. But she used to say, keep your eyes on your own work, yeah. which you can take to a spiritual level. Like, what is God calling me to do? I need to keep my eyes on my own family, my own children. And then she used to also say, don't blow out someone else's candle to make yours brighter. And I think we can do that, too, when we compare. As moms, we can say, well, I would never choose to feed my child that way or we moralize certain aspects of parenting that don't need to be moralized. Yeah. We're all trying to be good moms. Maybe we make different choices and dole out love in different ways, but imperfect love is still love. Yeah. And I think we need that message out there that that you're giving your best, you're doing your best, and you're going to fail sometimes. And right. that's when mercy comes in. Your kids, my kids learn a lot about mercy in my house. Yeah, <laughs> plenty of opportunities to yeah. say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> The uh, comparison thing, I mean, it's painful. It's not only about, I wish Joy was here, you know, to, to share, <laughs> but it's not only about women, right? I mean, everybody's comparing themselves to everything. Guys yeah. do the same kind of thing. And it really is debilitating. It I, is. If you're doing that, it's debilitating, and it's not the place of, of peace. And then I guess the other part of that is 
doing it to other people. Oh, yeah. And the judgment. Oh, so that, that's a part of your book, too, because you speak about let the competition begin. Yes, the mother. Just speak to me about that. There's a chapter, let the competition begin. Well, Motherhood is a competition. Well, I just see so many moms, like I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, I know personally in my own mothering when I started, I, what, I still am a little type A and a perfectionist, but I've come a long way. I'm, I'm definitely more yeah. of a perfectionist in recovery. But I used to want to do all of these elaborate crafts. And I say I wanted to, but I didn't really want to. I just yeah. saw the other moms doing, to, you know, maybe even to celebrate the liturgical year, beautiful things. Yeah. Well, it gave me the hives to have glue out and all these kids making messy things. And then I ended up yelling and being a crazy mom. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm supposed to be bonding over my children right now. And my, my, my oldest, we have the name Sum Sumami instead of Tsunami, <laughs> when kind of mommy loses it and crashes into the room. And, yeah. But I realized... I need to look at what the talents that I have. I love sports and a being active. So it's more fun for me and my children to go outside and to go on a run together or to shoot baskets than to me to try and sew or do elaborate crafts. That's just not my gift. I'm creative in other ways. So I think that it can be debilitating because you think, oh, well, this awesome mom is doing all of this. I need to do this. And it's just like I had a mom after a recent speaking engagement tell me, I'm never doing the Jesse tree again during Advent. <laughs> and she wasn't meaning that the Jesse tree isn't a wonderful tradition, but she said that you see all these good things that other moms are doing and you think that you have to do it all and you can't you're gonna burn out and you need to just kind of look at you know what do I enjoy what talents has God given me yeah. and how can I put them to use in my family right right in some part of your book you speak about and I may be phrasing it wrong you can correct me but it's kind of like our Catholic faith it's so sublime in terms of womanhood you say um, the feminine genius mm -hmm. you know we often hear that in our faith and the, you know the greatness of, of woman and, and of Our Lady but you say it's a two-edged sword what do you mean that the great teaching and loftiness and the call of, of Catholicism for for woman for motherhood can be a two-edged sword how does that work well motherhood is a sublime beautiful vocation within the Catholic Church yeah. but I think the problem is is if we I, I, the chapter, I, I call it Queen Mommy. Okay. If we coronate motherhood, it can become a form of idolatry, idolatry where we are putting so much into it that we are ignoring our relationship with God, for example. Yeah. Another thing is, is that if we say that motherhood, and it is a sublime vocation, but if we only talk about it in terms of being a beautiful, wonderful, everything is always great, and we don't talk about the, the children that maybe leave the faith. That's a big thing. That I, I interviewed a lot of moms for this book, and the pain they have when a child loses, lo loses the church, loses themselves to addiction yeah. or to an eating disorder or whatever the pain they have. Well, if we're, we're saying that this is the most important th thing right. we do and the only thing we do, think about the pressure when things don't always work out the way that we think they should. I mean, our children are created to fulfill God's will, not our will, not their own will. Yeah. And I know I'm a crazy control freak. And yeah. I, I um, the first time I realized I did not have control and I got permission from my daughter to share this story is I, ha I, I had to get her to go to the bathroom because she was, when we were doing t potty training, she wasn't going poop on the toilet anymore. Yeah. So I would sit in there and say, please go. And the pediatrician said, she will not be able to hold it in. We're going to put her on this medicine. She held in her poop for 15 days. And I sat there crying in the bathroom thinking, I have no control over this child. But that was a wonderful lesson for me to learn early yeah. on. Because now is there, you know, it, it, bigger things are happening that don't have to do with <laughs> ball movements. But I'm seeing that yeah. I'm not in control. I have to, I, being a mother is very, very important. But for all the moms, think of all the moms who suffer from infertility and miscarriages. Yeah. I mean, the hurt that they have if they think the only thing that a Catholic woman can do to give glory to God is to bring children into the world. They're, they're, we are spiritual mothers, too. We have other gifts that we have to nurture. And our children need to see that. They need to see us, even if it's as simple as being a really good hostess. Like I have a friend that's yeah. a stay-at-home mom. She's awesome, but she always opens her house. You like, I'll go on a run with her, and she'll yeah. be like, "You want to come in, and I'll make you breakfast." Right. She's so good about that. That's her gift, and she's using that. Right. And if she said she was too busy all the time taking care of her kids, then she wouldn't so, be able to use that. So gift. Other women could see this and say, "I need to open my home," or if I'm not, then I'm a bad mother. 
No, you need to find your own gift. Yeah. Yep, and find exact. You know, yeah. what 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 sets you um, is a passion that makes you feel alive with God. And I, I t I've told a lot of. Um, it's really sad to me. Some women have said, "Well, I don't know what I'm good at anymore. We've lost our. You know, secular society says that children can be identity thieves, but I think it's how yeah. we view motherhood. Yeah. If we view motherhood as our highest and absolute calling, then of course it's going to rob us of something. And that's but what it, you say here. You yeah. say motherhood is not the most important job a woman has. And then you have in front of each chapter, you have what's called evil earworm and unvarnished truth. Evil earworm is being a mother is the most important thing a Catholic woman can do. And the unvarnished truth is motherhood is actually not your highest calling. Being a daughter of God is and uh, that's the bullet that's right at the center that we got to reorient around yeah. unpack that some yeah and I, well i was thinking with that chapter two and the the martyr the ma i have a mom the martyr chapter okay. if you think about the saints and martyrs their suffering was secondary to their love for god and their trust in god yeah. so many moms now we think that we think that we're serving our children right. because of our love of God, but we're doing things like making paper mache projects and doing our kids' book reports and um, uh, baking everything from scratch. You're not and supposed to do your kids' book reports. No, you're no. not. <laughs> but I know, but the, you read and you see yeah. that moms are doing this. And you know, before Why are they doing that? They, it's got to be really good. Yes, it's got <laughs> to be perfect. Uh, yes, it's got to be perfect. And they see that other moms, maybe, or other kids, you see the other kid that's the overachiever and you think, well, gosh, I must not be a good mom because my child isn't. We don't let our children sometimes be who they're created to be either. We're not all mm. supposed to do, I mean, think of St. Therese. She did little things with great love. But I think we all want to be Joan of Arcs now, yeah. you know, like go out to battle and fight. And, and so you have to look, why am I doing this? Um, I need to do every, unite my will with God's will. I am a child, a beloved child of God first. What is he calling me to do? Not just as a mother, but as a woman and a human being. Yeah. So. And I, I, that's, that's critical for men and women. You know, that, at our Lord's baptism, you know, that voice, the Father's voice and the Holy Spirit was there. This is my beloved son with whom I am pleased. That's the center. That's the flow out. So I guess every woman really needs to hear, especially moms. Yeah. You're my beloved daughter, and I'm really pleased with you. Now, you might say back as a perfectionist, I'm certainly you will, and I, I say it as a guy. Well, let me tell you the, why are you pleased with me. There's a hundred things, things that I'm doing. Do wrong. Said, but no, it's, it's you I love. You. Not what you're doing all over here, although there are consequences for what you do and what you don't do. I love you. And moms need to hear that. Dads need to hear that because a lot of times, you know, the, the work of motherhood doesn't really, well, the work of fatherhood doesn't renew you. I mean, you're pouring out. That, that, that's not going to renew you. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's that intimacy with God and, and true intimacy and, and unconditional love with your spouse, you mm -hmm. know. Well, that's the other thing. You can ignore all these other relationships. If that are important. It's important to have friends. It's important to put your marriage first if you're blessed to be raising children in with a, 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 a husband. Yeah. It's important to have, obviously, your relationship with God um, if you are called to the workforce colleagues. So there's all these other relationships that, that need nurturing. And there are certain t times in a mother's life where it is all consuming. I mean, I have a four month old who's still waking up a, a lot at night. I'm not gonna say, oh, you know what? I'm getting past perfect. I'm not gonna feed you at 3 a.m. Sorry, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I, you know, of course there's yeah. this emptying of self and this giving, but I think we always have to look at, is this what God is calling us to give? Or are we giving, are we serving our family too exclusively? Which is tough for mo moms are like, what, what? How can I serve too exclusively? Um, and also, as we've talked about um, before the show, when we were talking about the freedom to, to fail and looking at, okay, mm. if God is the perfect parent and I want to be more like him, let's take a look at his kids. And <laughs> I mean, they crucified him and now all of us, you know, we make mistakes all the time and then there's horrible things, yeah. God's children going yeah. on in the world, yeah. but he is the perfect parent. So don't let your parenting or some your children's behavior being an indictment of your character or, or your worth as a woman. Excellent. Let's take a break at this point. It's Kate Wicker. The name of the book is Getting Past Perfect. It's a real 
blessing for you mothers out there and for every woman. Lots to come. We want to hear from you. Give us a call. Send us an email. You could speak with Kate and ask her whatever question you'd like. She knows everything about motherhood. She's not quite perfect, <laughs> no. but uh, she's here for you. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're an important part of this family, and we want to hear from you. 800-221-9460 or 275-271-2980. Or you can email us, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. You can speak with Kate now. Email, call in, share about your own motherhood, the successes and the failures, and get the book, Getting Past Perfect. Um, you have, I love some of the titles that you give here. And so this one says, I love motherhood, except when I don't. <laughs> Sounds a little conflicted, or is that just true? <laughs> I love motherhood, except when I don't. You're not supposed to enjoy every moment. Do women really need to be told that? I think we do. I think there's this, uh, especially again in Catholic mothering circles, we do see children as blessings. We are passionately pro-life, which is a beautiful thing. But then I tell a funny story. I can remember once I was at the grocery store with, um, I didn't have the baby, so it was my four other ones who were very close in age, and then we had a little bit of space. And they were all just, oh, just getting on my nerves, basically, asking for things and fighting. Oh, she poked me, she looked at me funny. Just, you know, the typical horrible grocery yeah. outing. But I was being very calm and, you know, oh, because I knew people were watching and I'm going to be such a witness of, you know, pro-children. And then we get out to my minivan and I have the pro-life license plate, yeah. choose life. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, come on, children, you know. And then the it slides shut, that minivan door, and ah, what is wrong yeah. with all of you? I was not cultivating virtue. I was just yeah. pretending, you know. Yeah. And so, but I think that it, it, I, I tell that story because I'm not a saint. I hope I one day will be, but I'm working, I'm stumbling towards it. Yeah. I'm no different than any other mom. Just right. a lot of times people will see you, you have more children and they'll say, oh, you must have, you know, the patience of Job or you must yeah. be a saint. And, and my kids are looking around like, did they just say patient? and in the same sentence to describe my mom, because I've actually had to really work on cultivating patience. And so I think it's really important for other moms, for us to have that solidarity mm -hmm. and to know, you know what, you're not alone. Sometimes motherhood is really tough and that doesn't devalue motherhood. That makes it all the more valuable because look, we're still showing up yeah. every day and loving these children and falling down on our knees to pray to God, Amen. you know? And so that is where we found the beauty and the sanctification that's why it's so sanctifying. Right. And I, I often say that, um, you know, sometimes I think we think our children are the only ones that push our buttons. But if motherhood is supposed to make us holy, then God's going to give us just the kind of children that push <laughs> our buttons. I always say to my um, sister-in-law who has a three-year-old, your daughter is the perfect three-year-old because she's not my three-year-old, you, you know, because I love being with my goddaughter yeah. and my niece, yeah. both my nieces and yeah. my nephew, because they're not mine. Yeah. And so I think that moms need to hear that though, because sometimes they think that something's wrong with them or their children. You know, why am I not enjoying this more? Yeah. Why is it hard yeah. sometimes? Yeah, I love it. I love motherhood except when I don't. Yeah. Margaret's on the phone. Welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Margaret, your question, your comment for Kate. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say how much I love your show. Um, you. Well, I'm wondering uh, what type of devotion do you have to the Blessed Mother or to Jesus in this um, perfection um, type atmosphere? Because it would seem to me that um, that would be extremely important. And it, Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your question. Well, I have little things that I like to, little, I guess you could say little prayers that I'll say like, Jesus, give me a moment of grace, or Jesus, I trust in you is a huge one. 
because if you can truly do that, then even in the, the tough moments when your your teenager speaking yeah. disrespectfully or or like happened to me one time, I my, my baby was quiet, I went into the room and he was finger, I don't mean to mention poop so much, but he was finger painting with his poop <laughs> and we called him Poop Casso after that. But, um, you know, to, to find Jesus, I trust in you in those You'd moments. You'd be surprised <laughs> how many people on our show have said that very thing. Oh. None. <laughs> no, people usually say to me, they're like, you poop say poop Casso? more than any other <laughs> person we've ever ever interviewed as far as our blessed mother <laughs> as a perfectionist I haven't had an issue yeah. um, having a devotion to her but I've talked to other Catholic women who say it's really hard for me to feel close to the mirror of perfection <laughs> who you know wow. had one kid and it was God <laughs> he was God and so they they've told me that that they've struggled with that so this is what I try and say the reason Mary my devotion to Mary is so strong number one uh, she was perfect, yes, but she accepted, again, that trust. She accepted, she didn't always understand things. Like when Jesus got lost in the temple and he said, you know, why, why are you worried? Don't you know who I am? She didn't completely understand what was going on, but no. she accepted it. So that acceptance is uh, so beautiful to me so that we can accept things, even if we don't understand them, even if we're not perfect. And number two, she wants to bring us to Jesus. She's mm, our mother. Amen. And think how much you love your mom. And then think how much you love our blessed mother. So don't worry about, don't compare, don't fall into the comparison <laughs> trap with Mary. Just try and be um, her daughter and, and rest in her. And that's where I found comfort, is just knowing Beautiful. she loves me. Let's take an email. My daughter and her husband have three kids and they work full-time jobs. The children always have the latest phones, video games, and any fad that comes along. How do I explain to my daughter that the children would appreciate more quality time with parents instead of material possessions. They could easily live off her husband's salary if they weren't buying the latest and greatest of everything. Karen from Texas. This is a tough one and I do allude to it. I talk about the kind of birthday parties that parents throw. Yeah. Uh, you know, they bring in a circus troupe and they, and they think that they think that, that is love. And I think a lot of parents, because we have guilt, we think whether we're working outside of the home, it's not even that. I know I've had guilt before. You know, maybe I had a bad day in the trenches and I think, well, they really wanted this book. Maybe I should buy them this book. And I've learned, no, they just want me. They want imperfect me. And it's gonna be hard to talk to, to, to people because they get defensive. They truly think that their kids need the latest and the greatest or the, the fancy, yeah. um, you know, birthday parties. But maybe ask your child and, uh, and say, what do you remember from our, your childhood? For instance, I remember going up every year to yeah. Chicago to Christmas with my so many cousins, 33 first cousins, just everywhere. I don't remember what I got as gifts. I remember the people. I remember my papa and his love for food and stuffing food in my face. <laughs> I remember um, my aunt making spritz cookies. You know, I remember these things that had nothing to do with what I got. And I think we really need to go back to that, not just with things, but also um, the activities, how many activities all our kids we feel like, and no wonder moms and kids are burnt out. You know, you're getting your kid to point A to point B, and then you have to get another kid to point C, and we think that we're showing them their love and we're helping them to be successful adults. But here's the thing, if your child loves Jesus, who cares if they can't be a you know, concert pianist, yeah. or if they're truly supposed to do that, then God will find a way to make them the concert pianist. Um, or if, you're, if your teenager has purple hair and you're, that really bothers you, do they love Jesus? Get over the purple hair. I mean, there's just, there's so many things that I think this perfectionism feeds into. I've talked to moms who say, oh, I'm not a perfectionist, and then I start talking to them, and they're still falling into some of these traps, giving right. their children high-tech right. phones because everybody else has it. So yeah. why do you have to keep up with the parental Joneses? It's hard, it is. Believe me, my 12 year old really wants social media. And she said, when can I have it? When you're 18. Yeah. No, really, when can I have it? When you're 18. <laughs> yeah. But you just have to, yeah. and I know a lot of her friends do. But you have me all the time. Yes, I know, <laughs> so exactly. So Speak um, to us about you know, the, the different stages mm -hmm. of motherhood. I mean, you've gone from, well, no, you, you're kind of, well, you've got five children, so you, you kind of, you were first pregnant about 25 or so. Yeah, I was 25. And now you're whatever age, 30-something. Yeah. <laughs> Getting uh, close to 40. <laughs> but the, the different stages of the, the look of perfectionist kind of thinking and disappointment and pain early on, teenage years, then maybe later on. Maybe I could speak about those in yeah. terms of marriage and being an in-law and so on and 
all of a sudden that perfection thing comes up. Now I'm supposed to be like this at this point of this phase, or or it hasn't happened. Therefore, it's I'm a, I'm a failure. Or, or yeah, it just doesn't stop. I talk a lot about the seasons of, of of motherhood too, because I think what happens is, whatever season you're in, it feels hard, and then you feel bad that it feels hard. And you wonder if maybe if I was a more perfect mom or my children were more perfect or perhaps I gave my children more things rather than more time and more love, things would be easier or better. When really it just changes. There's different challenges. So what may be challenging to me right. isn't going to be challenging to you anymore. Right. Like you're navigating the in-law situation yeah. and I obviously right. am not there yet. Um, and I'm just on the cusp. I have a child about to be a teenager. Wow. So I'm on the cusp of all of that. But Again, I interviewed moms because I wanted to really capture all walks of life. And it's if it's hard, then it's hard. Don't compare crosses. That's what my mom used to always say. Don't compare crosses. Don't compare crosses. It's not enough we compare with each other, then we got to compare the yeah. cross. And that's the martyrdom thing again, too, in there. Yeah, so. and I think God is going to give you the cross you need to yeah. bring him closer to you. And that cross might be easy to me, but then my cross might be easy to you, but it's hard for me. So I don't. I think we just we can't feel like we're weak or a bad Catholic or a bad mom because something is hard for us and it doesn't seem hard for someone else. Because if it's hard, it's hard. And we just need to accept that and that's where the grace comes in. We need to open ourselves to grace and um, to God's compassion and mercy and, and He's gonna help get us through it. But yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think back when I had one child and I'm always cautious to say this, um, it was so hard having one baby. And now I tease my husband, I'm going to run away with this baby and leave the rest <laughs> of you guys and just cuddle with him. And I, it's just because things have changed. And it's not that, Yeah. I, it, it, and I, I don't ever want to make a mom feel badly because she finds it hard, because I did too. But now I find this hard. And that makes me human. And that's why I always say we're not superhumans. We're yeah. humans who depend upon supernatural grace. Yeah. And we have to turn in, turn to God. You, know, you share in your book about maybe some friends that are childless, and there could be numerous reasons, you know, mm -hmm. for that. And uh, you know, you reflect on that, you share about that. And, and in my own experience, I mean, only God knows. Okay, let's take away you just can't have a child physically and the pain of that. But there are some that are really indoctrinated philosophically, almost into the joyfulness of being childless. Okay, you know, some. It seems like some people are buying into that, mm -hmm. and, and that's part of the, the pressure. But then you also share about there are women who aren't having children or open to children because they're really afraid of their own failure, that, that they think it is a big deal. It's such a big deal. They're not putting down children. They're just saying, like, this is such a big deal, and they're so wonderful or whatever that I couldn't do this because I'm going to mess them up or I'm just going to speak about that. Yeah in terms of the fear of having children, or maybe you have a child, and you said, well, I did that one, or that was really hard, or this is really going good, I'm the one to mess things up. Yeah. So speak into that. Well, I think a lot of times, like you said, we're afraid we're gonna mess things up, and I'm here to tell every woman out there, you're going to mess things up sometimes. You're gonna mess up. And the sooner you accept that you're gonna fail sometimes, the less pressure you're gonna put on yourself. Yeah. When you do fail, that's when mercy flows. And so I think it really helps. I tried so hard to be perfect and then in the beginning and You were really trying I to was. Do that. I was. And I some family dynamics that I grew up with, I was afraid that if I let my baby cry at all or if any, you know, if if I wasn't the perfect mom, she would have this black hole that she would have to to fill with, you know, promiscuity or drugs or, or whatever, and it would be my fault. And, I mean, I truly uh, believed this for a while, and it's been so liberating to me to say, um, my parents always say, don't take credit, and they told me this when I was a first mom, and I was like, whatever, whatever. But now I, I'm like, you were right, mom and dad, thank you. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> don't take credit for the good, because then you don't have to take credit for the bad. And that's so freeing, and what that means is- Let's say that phrase again. So, don't take credit for the good because yeah. then you don't have to take credit for the bad. <laughs> so basically, yeah. um, any good that comes, yeah. I give it to the glory of God. Yeah. I, you know, the, my child wins a citizenship award, yes. My child <laughs> hits his sister, <laughs> picks his nose in every picture right. or whatever. I, he didn't learn about picking his nose from me. And, you know, I don't, you know. So, but no, I'm not going to take credit for anything. I'm going to give it all. <laughs> but no, seriously. And I think that we can put so much, so much, um, as we've talked about, yeah. pressure on ourselves and think that um, 
that we have more control than we do. You know, the whole mother knows best. Yeah. Sometimes we don't. And sometimes there's other people who can step in and help us and we need, we need our it. Simons and Veronicas to help us carry the cross. And Let's take a phone call from uh, Lillian. You're on the phone here. You're at home with Jim and Joy. Your question, your comment I for Kate. Thank you, Jim. God bless you and Joy. That's Not quite able to hear Lillian, so you might want to call back or maybe somebody can put it up on the monitor for me, the question, but try again. We'll have you call back. Oh, here it is. How do we, <laughs> letter by letter, how do we teach children about the faith? How do we teach them? So is it just didactic, catechesis, our lives, success, failure? I, I mean, how there's so many. This is a, we could have a whole show on this particular question. Yeah. But I think in the beginning, again, I would have these tea parties that were beautiful, and we still occasionally have them, but I would have these feast, saint feast days and was constantly talking about the saints, and, 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 and that's a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong. But I was doing so much that sometimes I would be snappy. And, you know, yeah. and if God is love, that, and I'm not acting very loving, who cares what I'm teaching them about? What kind of example, yeah. you know, how can yeah. I be a joyful mom? So do I still talk about the saints? Do we still yes. do? Yes, but like this year for All Saints Day, I made a cake, we put our little saint dolls around it, and each child researched a saint. But I didn't make any saint costumes, because again, remember, I can't sew. And it used to be stress me out, I'd try and sew all these costumes for mm -hmm. all the kids. We still got to the point that we're trying to be saints and trying to help each other get to heaven. That was the point. The point, if you want to do all the extra stuff and that helps and you love it and you enjoy it, go for it. But we teach our children by being witnesses to Christ's love, being his hands and feet. And when we mess up, again, and I focus on this a lot, but it's so important. Something that I tell my kids is you can, do, you can never do anything to earn my love and you can't do anything to take it away. And one day I lost it as a mom, wasn't super nice, and I was, you know, crying and I was going to, I wanted to go to confession. I was very sad and my oldest came and patted me on the back and she said, Mommy, what's wrong? I said, I just, I was a lousy mom today. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And she said, Mommy, there's nothing you can do to take away my love and there's nothing you have to do to earn it. And our children wow. are, they're, they're so ready. They want us. And they don't, they want us in the cookies, I say. They don't care if Pillsbury does some of the work, though. <laughs> and they don't need anything fancier than that. And I, I've fallen into the trap, too, where I think that they need all this. And they just want me. Just, I mean, just me to sit beside them sometimes. And we've complicated it and yeah. made it so big. And that's where they're going to find out that God is love. Yeah. When and that gets back to, you know, you're saying more or less, you know, motherhood is not your highest calling, right? This is to know your identity in God, to hear the Father say to you, you're my daughter and I'm really pleased with you, to be able to really own that and to really learn that in the midst of your failures, which are just, they're gonna happen. I mean, it's gonna come, that's why we have a savior. And your children catching that in terms of education, finally being able to look at you when you fail and say, and say what your center is supposed to be is that I love you, mommy, you know, just for who you are no matter what, not because of you do everything exactly yeah. right. That's got to be the basis of our home and of our family and of yes. the human person. And that raising. frees them, too, because they think, oh, mommy doesn't have to be perfect all the time. She messes up and she says she's sorry. I don't have to be perfect all the time, you know, to give. Because sometimes I could be too hard. Perfectionism, even if we don't struggle with it ourselves, yeah. we might put that pressure on our children. Like every time they misbehave or a toddler doesn't sit still in a restaurant, we freak out. They're just a toddler. Or our teenagers yeah. are going to, you know, be disrespectful sometimes. And we need to offer them the same forgiveness and mercy um, as, our, as we give ourselves. Yeah. Let's take a break at this point. More to come with Kate. We're going to hold her over for the final segment. Again, we're speaking about getting past perfect, how to find joy and grace in the messiness of motherhood. Please don't go away. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come.
welcome back. You're an important part of the EWTN family. You could have been right at home with Jim and Joy and Kate today. Please plan a pilgrimage. Come on down to Irondale. Go up to Hansville. Visit and pray at Mother's Resting Place. It's pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Whether you're one person, 50, 100, I can't tell you how happy people are when they come here. And some, it's been like a lifelong hope that they would come. Give us a call, don't put it off. 205-271-2966. We're gonna go to Joan Lewis right now in Rome. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to everyone at home and a very exciting times here, as they always are, really. We had the Pope's amazing trip to Fatima last weekend. Then on Sunday, he spoke of that spiritual experience at the Regina Celi. And Monday, there was the opening of a very exciting exhibit in the Vatican, in the Charlemagne Hall, just off of St. Peter's Square and at Rome's Jewish Museum. Now, the exhibit is entitled The Menorah, Worship, History, and Myth. And I did talk to one of the main archaeologists who made a lot of discoveries that are being uh, seen here in this exhibit, Dina Gorni. And this is a combination of the Rome Jewish community, the Israeli Antiquities Office Authority, and also the Vatican Museums. Now, the menorah, of course, is that seven-armed candelabrum that we read about in the Torah and that we see depicted in both Jewish and Christian art um, throughout the centuries. Now, the exhibit features one of the rarest works of art archaeology, a discovery done by Dean, as a matter of fact, the celebrated Magdala stone. You know Mary Magdalene. She's Mary of Magdala. And if you've ever been to the Holy Land, you've been to Magdala. It's on the Sea of Tiberias, also known, of course, as the Sea of Galilee. Now, the stone was found in the ruins of a first century synagogue, and that was just like 20 inches below the topsoil, undisturbed for two millennia until Dina and her crew founded it. Now, Mary of Magdala was the focus of the Pope's audience on Wednesday, and he called her an apostle of hope. Francis said that Jesus, after rising from the dead, spoke to Mary of Magdala, and just as he did with her, so too, Jesus tell, calls each of us by name and fills us with joy at his presence. Our encounter with him transforms our life and brings about undying hope. The Pope said, the risen Lord tells Mary not to cling to him, but to go out and to spread the good news of his resurrection to others. And he thus said, Mary Magdalene thus becomes the apostle of hope. So, well, there's lots of good news here and it's my job to bring it to you, but time's up. So back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. It's always wonderful to hear from Joan. She brings us that firsthand information from our Holy Father, what's happening at the epicenter of our faith there in Rome. You know, as we've been sharing and just listening to you, to your story, knowing so many other godly women, um, you're funny. I mean, you are really funny. But this whole thing of perfectionist tendency or really true clinical perfectionism, it's painful. It I mean, is. And I, I can't say some of the women that I've seen, whether they're really perfectionists or you have that tendency, but so often if you speak to moms, you know, they go to bed at night and they just feel like, there's so many ways I'm failing. There's so many, and this thing is all over you. Your final chapter, when there's no joy in mothering or in life, being a mom is hard, but you don't have to do it alone. When there is no joy in mothering or in life, yeah, that was probably the hardest chapter to write because I am someone who likes to have this, I'm fine, you know, everything's going fine. And I actually suffered some from some major clinical depression and anxiety. And I, I felt like in order to be authentic, I needed to share about it. Yeah. And I had to tell, the only one who truly knew was my husband um, mm -hmm. when I was going through it. And I'm very close to my family. So I had to tell them when the book came out that it might be painful for them. But the reason I shared that is because I want moms to know that you may not have clinical depression, you may not have clinical anxiety, but you may be suffering. <laughs> and it, it is hard. Yeah. And you need to reach out for help and not think that if you prayed harder or if you were a better Christian, yeah. you, th this would not be a part of your life. Right. Um, there are horrible things that we go through as moms. Sometimes mental health illness, sometimes we lose a child. Our marriage falls apart. 
and whatever it is, yeah. you're, you've got to know that you're not alone. You've got God mm -hmm. and you've got people who want to care and minister to you. And w the beautiful virtue to me is hope. And it's such a, it's a theological virtue. And hope, I don't mean hope like chasing a unicorn in the sky, but hope that things aren't always going to be where they are right now. This too shall pass and that there, we're, we're a faith of redemption and a faith of hope. And that, that's part of the pro-life movement too. We're, 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 we're hopeful that things are gonna be okay. Yeah. And if the story doesn't have a happy ending, maybe that's because it's not over yet. Because mm. God, God is an author that throws in surprising plot twists and mm. we don't know how it's gonna end. And we just have to keep going forward and asking for help. Kate, you know, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story and for this book. I know you're touching many people, especially mothers, young and old alike. The name of the book again is Getting Past Perfect, Kate Wicker. And uh, one of the key elements that Kate's been sharing again and again is that remember in the midst of motherhood, it's not your biggest calling. God wants you to know you're my daughter you're a child of God, that he loves you unconditionally. He wants you to know his divine affirming love and you'll be the best mother that you can possibly be. So be encouraged. Share with others, you're not alone. You're an important part of the EWTN family and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.